everybody, Hope Church. It's great to be here. And if you're like me, your heart's already been stirred toward the Lord and encouraged toward Him and just blessed to be able to worship Him and blessed to be able to worship with His church here. I'm going to read a few scriptures here, then shortly we'll have a time of the Lord's Supper together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for speaking us, speaking to us through the words of the songs that we sang already, Lord. We bless you for the ministry of your Holy Spirit, just bringing us to that place of receiving from you. Open your skies of, for us to have your mercy. We just sang about that, Lord. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you have mercy abundant, abundant for those who come to you and acknowledge their sins, confess, and forsake them. The scripture says you just have an abundance of mercy for those of us in that place of need. We bless you. We just pray our time here today, Lord. The remainder will just still be encouraging to you and uplifting for all of us to speak to our hearts and, and do the work that only you can do, Lord drawing and encouraging and open the eyes of our heart toward you in Jesus name amen the first public message that Jesus shared is recorded in Matthew 417 it's actually before the Sermon on the Mount it just simply says this in Matthew 417 that from that time Jesus began to preach and to say repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand true repentance True repentance, and I wrote a definition here that really helps me to kind of nail it from my own thoughts. It's the God-granted Holy Spirit-empowered repentance that's called for throughout the Bible. It's a clear call to a personal, absolute, and unconditional surrender, being in total submission to God as your sovereign Lord of your life. Though it includes sorrow and regret, repentance is more than that. In repenting, we make a complete change of direction, 180 degrees turn. We turn around from where we're going. We turn to God. We forsake sin. We turn away from serving ourselves and anything else that may be competing and distracting us from walking and living in the light with Jesus Christ as our closest companion. Repentance is all that. Need a new mic. Is that on? Can you hear me? Okay, here we go. Okay, well, I'll just confess it was my fault. It was off. So, sorry about that. I finally saw the little on and off thing over here. Uh, but, yeah, I'm going to read that again. The God-granted Holy Spirit-empowered repentance called for throughout the Bible is a clear call to a personal, absolute, and unconditional surrender being in total submission to God as your only sovereign Lord of your life. It includes sorrow and regret, but repentance is much more than that. In repenting, we make a complete change of direction, a 180 degree turn around toward God, forsaking sin, turning away from yourself, and anything else that is competing or distracting you from walking and living in the light with Jesus Christ as your closest companion. God communicates man's need to repent throughout the whole Bible. And one verse I'm going to read right now is from the book of Proverbs. Even though, you know, repentance was the first message that Jesus gave, it's, it's throughout the Bible. And here's Proverbs 28, 13. And man, can I relate with this. He who covers his sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. 
God pours out his abundant mercy to all repentant people. These would be people who are no longer are interested in having hidden areas of their life. They no longer want to pursue the things of the darkness. They want everything up on the table. They want to walk in the light. That's what repentance is. When we read Psalm 32, you're welcome to find that in your Bibles if you like. But, but three times in Psalm 32, David wrote the word Selah. I used to just not worry about that. I just thought, oh, it's a little side note. But Selah is important. And apparently that Hebrew word is hard to really narrowly translate to get it really pinpointed down. But it's generally understood to being a pause or to contemplate. Think about it. And maybe in times where they inserted a musical interlude to reflect on the words that were just sung in that psalm. It could be maybe like our instrument. I don't know much about music, but it could be like an instrumental bridge in a song. I think they had one on that last song where just the instruments played. It could be that's the Selah part where you're just thinking about pausing Selah. Listen for that word in Psalm 32. And this is a psalm of confession and repentance as well from David. David is saying, Blessed is he who transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, and whose spirit there is no deceit no darkness when I kept silent my bones grew old through my groaning all day long for night and day your hand was heavy upon me and my vitality was turned into the drought of summer Selah think about that when I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I have not hidden I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Selah. And that's something to reflect about, isn't it? The iniquity of our sin being forgiven. We should think about that. We should pause and consider that. Verse 6, For this cause, everyone who is godly shall pray to you in a time when you may be found. Surely in a flood of great waters they shall, they shall not come near him. You are my hiding place. You shall preserve me from trouble, and you shall surround me with songs of deliverance. Selah. Think about it. Contemplate that. This God of ours surrounding you in place of trouble with songs of deliverance. In verse 8, I will instruct you. I will teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse. I've been like the horse. Do not be like the mule, which have no understanding which must be harnessed with a bit and a bridle, else they will not come near you. Many sorrows shall come to the wicked, but he who trusts in the Lord, mercy shall surround him. And I don't know about you, but I noticed the theme of mercy in the songs we sang today, and I was blessed by that. He recovers his sin. It says in Proverbs 28 again, will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. We're going to take a sila, a pause. Uh, Jonathan, I'll leave that red Bible there. Did I bring it up here? Oh, here it is. Hang on. We're going to take a pause and reflect on the words of Scripture before we take the Lord's Supper here. You can turn to 1 Corinthians 11 and just contemplate the life in these words. I'm going to start reading at verse 23. Paul's writing, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the night the Lord Jesus, on that same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, and he said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Can you recall when you first came to Jesus, when the lights finally came on, and you understood 
what Christ accomplished for you. If you're like me, it was things that you were trying to accomplish for yourself up to that point. Clean my life up, do enough good works to outweigh the bad, and live in a life of frustration. But do you remember when you first understood that Christ accomplished for you what you couldn't accomplish for yourself? We're going to take the and partake in the bread and cup together. And as they're going to be passed around, just, just take a selah between you and God. Reflect and, and worship the Lord together about what he accomplished for you when he gave up his body, when he shed his blood. Feel free to just continue sitting, stand if you'd like. If you're reminded that there's somebody that you need to talk to or make things right with, feel free to do that. If you have sins to confess to the Lord, this is a great time to do that. But once everybody is served, then we'll partake together and we'll have a word of prayer there. But we're going to just play a song now as, as the bread and the, the cup are passed around. Before we get back to uh, some repentance uh, verses and just the, the blessings of that, uh, let's open up in prayer. Father, thank you again so much for your word. We're not helpless or orphaned. We have help. We have comfort. We have a heavenly father who has adopted us to become his sons and daughters. Thank you, Lord. Just, we just pray this time would be something that you use through your Holy Spirit and through your word like only you can do, Lord, to draw our heart to you, to open the eyes of our understanding, and to just give us comfort where we need it, help where we need it, wisdom where we need it, to give us what we need, Lord. Would you just please do what only you can do during our time together? In Jesus' name, amen. And before we get started, it's time, it's time for the cultural minute. Occasionally, I'm going to have a cultural minute up here. I'm going to share just for about a minute, maybe two, of something in our culture that should be addressed, and it should be addressed by the church. And so some of these topics I'll do over the course of who knows how long, and I only speak here, by the way, once every about four or five weeks, so don't worry, it's not going to happen every week. But I feel compelled just to share a few scriptures and address issues in our culture like abortion, like marriage like substance abuse, like a whole host of things, and give God's heart on it. Put it in perspective of what God has spoken on it. So this is the cultural minute today. Hang on to your seats. And my attention here is just to briefly clarify from God's word something in our culture that we're told is a gray area. We're told it's an area for compromise. We're told that it's an area that we should be tolerant of, of changes in are tolerant of falsifications about. We're, to we're told all sorts of things, except what God has clearly spoken to us about. So today's cultural minute is on marriage. No applause. <laughs> I'm sharing here what God himself has already said. These aren't Mark Renaud's ideas. I didn't come up with this plan and design. This is what God has said. And it's a great solid foundation anchor for all of us. Let's hear it for God. He's the author and creator of marriage, of what marriage is, of what we as followers of the Lord should freely embrace because God has said it. And he's clearly communicated to us the way things ought to be. As a young Christian, yeah, I used to say, and, and it's just, it was like part of me, I used to say thing, this sta statement. God said it. I believe it. That settles it. And you know what? In simplicity, that works. It's the way it ought to be. But I've noticed several years later, even now, I've trimmed it down to be even more simple. It's just simple now. It's God said it. That settles it. My belief in embracing it doesn't change the truth. If God spoke it, settled it, it's settled, regardless of who embraces it or who is disgusted by it. It's settled in heaven. God's word is settled in heaven for how long? Forever. Scripture says his word is settled in heaven forever. And that includes the cultural minute today on marriage. It's settled. And hopefully as a person or a follower of Jesus Christ, I embrace what he has spoken. I embrace what he's declared. To see, and I can see, and I'm able to see his wisdom and his kindness in what he's declared and said and spoke. God's view of marriage 
or the marital covenant, according to God, is between one man, one woman, and the Lord himself. Period. There's a period. Any other definition or any other cultural twist on that is simply a falsification of what God has already spoken. God's real marriage does not include two women. God's real marriage does not include two men. God's real marriage does not include three people. Our people and animals, our people and trees, our people and themselves. No, God has shared this without ambiguity multiple times from Gen Genesis to Revelation. Marriage is a covenant between one man, one woman, and the Lord himself. That's marriage. Jesus made it very plain. You know the words in red in the New Testament? That's like the one Jesus spoke. These are words in red. From Matthew 19, Jesus said to them, Have you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two but one flesh. Therefore what God has joined together, let not man separate. These are the words of God. If you take issues with his words, take it up with him. Your issues with him. And by the way, who got to go to Jason's wedding? Yeah, we were there. Lots of you guys were there. It was an awesome message, if you recall, that the pastor gave today at that wedding. But just a quick finality here. Sim six simple things that Jesus himself said in them verses we just read from Matthew 19. First one is, have you not read? That's what Jesus said. Jesus said, hey, God's already spoken on this. It's in the Bible. It's there to read. Why haven't you read it? Well, have you not read it? It's truth. Jesus also said, he who made them. Jesus said this is a statement from the creator, the one who made the male and the female. The one who made them in the beginning. It says, he who made them. And then said, Jesus says, number three, made them male and female. That's what Jesus said. God himself, the creator Jesus Christ, made them, and he made them male and female. Jesus said there's only two genders, male and female. Anything else, according to the scripture, is a lie. It's a change. It's a perversion of the truth. It's a twisting of reality. It's been that way from the beginning, male and female. Nothing more, nothing less. No such thing as transitional forms, because he who made them made them either male or female. That's what the Word of God says. You can read about it. It's period. There's no confusion. There's no ambiguousness about it. Number four, because God has spoken and because you should have read about it already, because he made them and because he made them male and female, Jesus said it's because of these things that a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. These are the words of Jesus. A man, a male, is to be joined to his wife, a female, and they become so closely united, so intertwined, so as to be described as one flesh, no longer two, but one. That's undeniable int intimacy described clearly as only between a man and his wife. That's the words of Jesus. And number five, therefore what God has joined together. Notice God is very much involved here. He's the one who joins the marriage people together, the husband and wife. He's the third cord of the threefold cord that's not easily broken. And therefore, Jesus said, what God is joined together, the sixth point, let not man separate. God's will for this man and this woman and his involvement, the threefold cord, cord is that no man should separate this bond. And that is how God defines marriage in the Bible. There's no confusion, there's no gray area, there's no misunderstanding, and for the follower of Jesus Christ, there's no shame in embracing and living under the blessing of this definition. And that's the cultural minute. Now back to, now back to the news. <laughs> Remember that the verse that we first read today from Proverbs 28, actually the second verse we read today. He who covers his sin will not prosper. Have you ever covered your sin up? That's a good question to consider this morning. This day, like all days, is a great day to get before God and consider for myself or for yourself before the Lord. Lord, am I 
or have I, or am I presently covering up my sin? Am I hiding something in my life? Is everything not up on the table? Am I shading or trying to deceive? Do I have secrets? Am I doing things that I know I shouldn't be? Is there an area of my life that I am shading from you or from those around me and walking in that type of darkness? He who covers a sin will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes their sin will have mercy. That's the good news. There's mercy available. No matter where we've been, once we get out of this covering of sin, we get it up on the table, we confess it, we forsake it, we turn of it, there's abundant mercy for that. And that's what we want. The covering up of sin takes away the ability to prosper. Who wants to prosper? And I want to prosper. Who wants to thrive and experience true life in the inner man? We don't want to fake it. We don't want to walk through the motions and, and act like we're having a good time and, and knowing on the inside we're dying. We want to prosper and thrive. We need the, the stability, the solid anchoring that comes from not living a life of hiding things, but instead living a life of light and truth, no darkness, no falsehood, being flooded with his mercy continually. By confessing, forsaking, and repenting totally from our sins, we are free because God delights in giving mercy to those who do not cover up their sin, but honestly confess and forsake them and repent from them. And today, yeah, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you this morning. I've experienced all this verse is talking about. Covering up of sin, confessing, forsaking, repenting, and being flooded with mercy. And if you've been born again, you've experienced it too. That's just the, the, the nature of man and the super nature of God intervening in that. I've covered up my sin from others. I've covered my sin from my parents. I've tried to cover them up from the Lord. I know what that feels like, and I know what that tastes like. I know what it feels like not to prosper. I know what it feels like to feel dark. I know what it feels like to feel like death or death warmed over. I've been in that kind of condition. But to God's credit, I also truly, with his grace and his power and his kindness to me, I love that song called Kindness Today. I've also truly confessed my sins. And I still do it on a regular basis because the great fruit that comes from that, the flooding of mercy that comes from that, I got sick of those to the point where the, thin that I, where the sin that I thought was so delicious became so completely distasteful to me. I've confessed all my sins to the Lord, and when needed and appropriate, I confess them to others as well, to my parents, to my siblings, I've got lots of brothers and sisters, to my wife, to my children, and to others that I've sinned against. It may be that confessing to God is enough. It may be that God might show you like he shows me times when I need to confess it to others, if others are involved. Also what I've experienced by the power and the grace that God gave me, I've also been able, apart from Mark being involved, to forsake sin. I know what it feels like turning my back on my own self, my own desires, my own pursuits the distractions that trip me up and keep me from thriving. I know what that feels like to turn from that, and it's awesome. And with all acknowledgement and tribute and praise to the Lord, I'm a grateful recipient of what it says in this verse. Whoever confesses and forsakes their sins will have mercy. Notice it's, it's not you might have some mercy. It's not you could have mercy. It's clear. You will have mercy when you confess and repent and forsake. And to go from a condemned sinner covering up sin in the condition that I lived in, covering up the darkness, the shame, living with constant a disapproval, with the weight of sin and guilt, sapping any measure of flourishing or feeling of doing well, to go from that to being flooded and washed over with his mercy, his kindness, his compassion, his forgiveness, is so completely indescribable it's so completely inexpressible. It's beyond description. I've been in awe of it for 37 years. I'm in awe today of it. What is this, God? This flooding of mercy to wash away the sins, to wash away 
the power of sin, the guilt of sin. I am con- and continue all of that, and I hope you are too. And it's more than a daily thing with me at this point in my life. You know, it's, it's a walk I have with God all day long. It's, it's from one moment to the next. And if you could see my thoughts up on the screen, and Joe, I hope you don't put them on the screen. <laughs> but I'm going to read some of them to you. This is, this is like bearing Mark Renaud. And I hope you, hope you hear the heart in this. Because this is, this is the way men man are. But I'm, I can see my thoughts projected on the screen. Lord, I confess I'm angry at times. I'm turning away from that. Would you please forgive me? Lord, I confess I have fear in this situation. Maybe you can relate with some of this. Maybe it's in your own brain, in your own heart. Lord, I confess I have fear in this situation. I'm now turning away from it. Please forgive me. Lord, I confess my impatience. Any, any parents in here? Anybody ever struggle with impatience? <laughs> Lord, I confess my impatience. This is an ongoing moment-by-moment conversation with God projected up on the screen, but I'll at least tell you about it. I'm turning away from it now. Please forgive me. Lord, I confess these unwholesome thoughts troubling right now. I'm turning away from them. Lord, I confess my lack of faith in this difficulty. I don't have faith for this situation, for this relationship, for this financial need. Lord, I confess that to you. I'm turning from it. Please forgive me and increase my faith in what you have stated in your word. Lord, I confess my pursuit of pleasure more than I'm pursuing you, and I'm turning away from it. Please forgive me. Please remind me that only in you I can find true lasting pleasures. Lord, I confess my selfishness, making me my own Lord instead of you, making my interest of utmost important instead of the interest of those around me. I am confessing and turning away from that, Lord. These are the words that could be on the screen if they finally get to where they project our brain words up there that you would see from from my brain because I'm still growing in Christ But also there'd be other words projected up on the screen coming from my brain and my heart that are just as important. Thank you, Father. Your mercy washes over me and brings me calm in the midst of this anger hurricane. Thank you, Jesus, for that calming assurance. Thank you, Father. Your mercy is washing over me and brings me courage in the midst of this fearful situation I'm in. Thank you, Father. Your mercy washes over me is now bringing me patience with my children or others. Lord, thank you that your mercy now is washing over me. Thank you that if I confess and forsake, you give me your mercy. And you bring me wholesome thoughts instead of unwholesome thoughts. Thank you that your mercy is washing over me and bringing me peace. It's bringing me true pleasure. It's bringing me into a place of submission to you instead of myself. Thank you, Lord, that your mercy is now washing over me and bringing me to this wonderful place where I can... In sincerity, look out for the interest of others more than the interest of my own self. So again, when God uses the words forsaking or repenting, this is what he has in mind. And I'll read this again. The God-granted Holy Spirit-empowered repentance called for in Scripture is a clear call to personal, absolute, unconditional surrender, being in total submission to God as the only Lord of your life. It includes sorrow and regret, but it's more than that. In repenting, we make a complete change of direction toward God, away from our sin, away from ourself, and away from the competing, distracting things that keep us from walking in the light with Jesus Christ as your closest companion. In turning to God wholeheartedly, we become indescribable recipients of his mercy, his love, his kindness, and we now have at our disposal a limitless supply of all we need to live godly. All we need to be completely transformed. And all we need to be an asset to those around us instead of a liability. All we need to lay our head on the pillow at night and sleep in true God-given peace. He gives his beloved sleep and peace. If you need forgiveness like I do often, it's available when you wholeheartedly turn to Christ in confession, forsaking, and repenting. If you need cleansing, just put a little check in your box in the brain as I'm reading this list and see if you need these things. All these are available when you wholeheartedly turn to Christ. If you need mercy, it's available. If you need justice, it's available. If you need grace, power to live as you ought to live, it's available. 
If you need to be transformed, it's available in Jesus Christ. If you need spiritual renewal in Christ, it's available. If you need encouragement, and who doesn't need that? It's available. If you need affirmation, and I'm, I'm an affirmation junkie. I'm sorry. I'm addicted. If you want to affirm me anytime, just go right ahead. I'll just suck it right in. <laughs> if you need affirmation, if you need wisdom, if you need to be delivered from anything, whatever is, comes in the imagination of men to be delivered from, it's available in Christ. His power is that great. If you need comfort, it's available. If you need help, it's available. If you need an answer to your prayers, and God delights in answering prayers, it's available. If you need strength, if your deepest hunger and thirst needs to be satisfied, it's available. If you need to be filled with Him, filled with the Holy Spirit, it's available in Christ as you turn in confession, forsaking, and repenting. It's available for you. If you need instructions on life, if you need faith, if you need stability or an anchor, if you need hope, if you need peace, if you need love, if you need assurance, if you need life, if you need saving from your sins, it's available in Jesus Christ. If you need anything that's not even on this list, <laughs> lay at the feet of Jesus and he'll, he'll meet that need somehow or, or change your mind over it. This list no doubt could go on and on. What we need what we need to prosper, to thrive, to have personal victory over sin, the sin that easily distracts us or cripples us, is available in Christ when we wholeheartedly turn to him. Laying our lives, our struggles at his feet, humbly submitting to him as Lord of our life, confessing, forsaking, we now, according to his word, become the grateful recipients of his mercy washing over us. What a trade-off. Garbage for gold. I mean, that's what it is, isn't it? It's the unfathomable trade-off on Craigslist. I got a pile of garbage. I want a lot of gold for it. No takers. But Christ himself came and was the taker. I've got gold for your garbage. Come and confess, forsake, and repent. That turns us to John's small letter that we call 1 John. It's just 10 verses. We're going to read chapter 1 because it's such a great passage on this of receiving forgiveness, cleansing, and walking in honesty, which is called walking in the light. Walking in light is honesty, walking in dark is lying. It's very simple. Just listen with me or follow along in your, in, in your Bible, but John, an eyewitness to Jesus Christ, says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, which our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested. We have seen it. We bear witness and we de declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us. That which we have seen, he repeats, and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. This is, the, this is where the joy of the season comes through, in Jesus Christ. Verse 5, this is the message which we have heard from him and now declare to you. Here's the message, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. What a message. You're tired of the darkness? You're tired of covering sin? You're tired of the shame involved with that? God is light, and in God there's no darkness. If we say we have fellowship with him and we still walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Amazing. Quickly through that passage now, just to make some observations. Verses 1 through 3. I've just listed out the information that we have that shows that this is from a first-hand source. This isn't passed down to John. This is J raw John. This is what John saw, heard, felt, and experienced. 
he uses words in these verses like, we have heard, and I'm just going to read through them, I highlight them. Some of them repeat, we have heard, we have seen, we have looked upon, our hands have handled, it was manifested to us, we have seen, we bear, false, we bear witness, we declare to you, we have seen, we heard. These are the words of a witness. These are the words of a first-hand account. This is not hearsay. This is not second-hand. This is one of the sons of thunder who walk with Jesus telling us what happened. In verse 4, these things we write to you that your joy may be full. John wants his reader to have their joys filled up. He wants us to have the, uh, the fullness of joy. And that's why he wrote the letter. Hey, I, I, I am so full of joy, John's probably thinking, I'm going to write these down so that everybody else can have their joy filled up too. In verse 5, this is the message which we have heard from him and declared to you that God is light, and in him no darkness at all. John now specifically wants to give us the message that he and the other disciples heard directly from Jesus. Directly from the life of the one who heard it, he declares to us that God is light, and in him there's no darkness at all. God has nothing to do, absolutely nothing to do with covering up sin. There's no darkness in God. There's no shame in God. It was important for John that his readers know that God is light. Jesus is light incarnate. I am the light who's come into the world, he said. Men are dark. Men dwell in darkness. But God is completely opposite. He is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. To John it was important to add that not only in him there is no darkness, but in him there is no darkness at all. Just to quit emphasize there. In verse 6, if we say that we have fellowship with him we, and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth, the darkness that we might walk in reveals the fact that we're not experiencing true fellowship with him. As soon as I step into some darkness, I'm, I'm fellowshipping with a lousy idea, I let fear overcome me, I'm not really experiencing close fellowship with God anymore. And that's the point here. The lie that we might be living reveals the fact that we're not practicing the truth. If we say we're in fellowship with God, then we will be like him. We will walk in the light. We will walk in honesty. We will walk in truth. And it will be plain to us and to others that we are truly in fellowship with God. And thank God for his mercy. If I step into darkness and I'm experiencing fear or impatience or lousy thoughts, and I confess those by the grace and power of God and I forsake them, repent, his mercy comes over. And washes that away, and I'm back in fellowship with him again. Satan wants you to think that you're stuck here. I got to experience this. You know, I, I deserve this. I got to do something to earn to get back out of here. I got to work harder. I got to go to church more, and I got to read the Bible more. I'm going to do some more good deeds. That's what Satan blends in there. But the scripture's clear, even in Proverbs. If, if we confess and forsake and repent, his mercy shows up and washes that darkness away. And that's the point here, First John. Verse 7, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. A couple great points here, a couple benefits of walking in honesty and in the light. We have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we're living on honesty, in, in honesty, if we're walking in the light, walking in truth, then two things are emphasized. We have true fellowship. We don't have to worry about faking it for our friends at church or our friends wherever. We're walking in the light. We have this true fellowship thing going on. It's not based on deception and outward performance and outward look. Everything's up on the table. Nothing is hitting. Nothing is shaded. And there's actually a life-giving fellowship with those around us. And you just can sense that. Have you guys been in a situation where you sense that? This is like a real fellowship situation with people. I've, I've been there. It's, it's awesome. The second thing is the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. That is the clearest picture of mercy that I can think of, being cleansed from all sin by the blood of Jesus. It's also mentioned back in Proverbs 28. John mentions that walking light, confessing sins, brings us to experiencing the blood of Christ cleansing us. Proverbs mentions that as well. Both verses are clearly saying that receiving mercy and undeserved cleansing is the result of walking in honesty, walking in light, walking in truth, and simply confessing and forsaking sin. And verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. The truth is not in us. A clear declaration from John, who was a godly man. If we lie and deceive even ourselves, we're liars indeed. And the truth is not in the man who declares he has no sin. 
But if we confess our sins, verse 9, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's the, in my mind, that's the New Testament verse of Proverbs 28, 13 that we read. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And then one more time, if we say we have no sin. In verse 8, if we say we have no sin, John says we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. In this verse, verse 10, he says, if we say we have no sin, John says we're calling God a liar and his word is not in us. Because God's already said that we sinned. God's already made that declaration. If you haven't heard, it, it's in the Bible too. It's a story of the sinfulness of man. And there's verses even like all have sinned. God's made that declaration. If we say now, now I haven't sinned, we're, calling God, we're saying God lied. God lied in his word. I, I haven't sinned. Yeah, well, God says you have sinned. Don't call him a liar. <clears throat> because God has already said we sin. God said it. And remember, if God says it, that settles it. I've sinned. We're actually sinners by, by birth. You know, Adam's sin falls on us all because we're the seed of sin. We're actually sinners by choice. If in some weird situation, Adam wouldn't have sinned, I, I'm sure I would have sinned finally got down to my generation but we're sinners by birth we're sinners by choice we choose to sin and we're sinners by divine proclamation god just declared you guys are sinners we're, we're we can't say we have no sin we're sinners in the eyes of god but if we don't cover that up if we confess that if we forsake that if we repent from that if we come to jesus and ask for forgiveness because he's already shed his blood, we're covered with his abundant mercy. It's available for all of us. Don't leave here today dragging your sin back home with you. Just confess that, forsake it, and repent, and be cleansed with his blood, with his mercy. So where does all this lead us? To me, these scriptures are just a call from God to be faithful. Like he is, he's faithful. To call upon God, to be filled with His Spirit, to be, to be recipients of His power, to live, walk, and obey Him by being faithful, and to not cover it up when we don't do that. To confess it, to forsake it, and to repent of it and be cleansed and free of it. A few things I've just noted here that we could be faithful in with the, by the power of God. We can be faithful to confess our sins. We don't have to run away from that. We can own that and say, yeah, that was me. I did that, God. And confession is simply just three things. Agreeing with God that you sinned. Agreeing that it is sin. And agreeing that the shed blood of Jesus cleanses and forgives that sin. That's what confession is. God, I did it. I know it was sin. And I'm asking now because of what Jesus did to forgive me of that sin. That's confession. Being faithful to confess our sins. Being faithful to forsake them and to repent from them, to turn from them, not to walk in them no more. We can be faithful to walk in the light, as John has shared with us. We can be faithful to share with others, like John did. We can share with others what we have seen. We can share with others what we have saw God do in our life. What we have heard from God and what God has done for us. We can be like John did. So we can see the joy of others fulfilled. We can walk faithfully in the small things with God. When I confess, forsake, repent, you know, those aren't big and glorious things. You know, I'm not going to shout it from the hotel, hey, I, I repented today. You know, I'm not going to write an article in a newspaper. Most time it's between me and God. Yeah, God, you're right about that. I, I blew that. It is sin. Would you please forgive me? But it's a small thing that has big results and big life-changing results for others around you. When I walk in the light and tell somebody else about Jesus and what he's done for me, that's not a big and glorious up on the stage type thing. It's an everyday spontaneous opportunity to, to help one soul at a time come to Jesus. That's what to be faithful in. There are small things that really do change the world. There are small things that can change the world and turn it upside down, even in your own home. 
you know, I often have told my wife, you know, we, we've had what every missionary goes to Africa to hope for. I've read stories of missionaries going to Africa or South America called by God to be there and had one convert in 30 years. And then that convert going and having an incredible ministry because that first missionary was faithful to what God had planned. But, you know, if you're a parent this morning, you have what every missionary sometimes actually dies for. You have a disciple, at least one in your home maybe a whole bunch of them, but you have opportunity to disciple them, to let, bring life to them, instruction to them. You have in your home in St. Jen County or Perry County, whatever county you live in, what missionaries die for, and that's people that are following you, and they love to hear you speak the truth. Don't miss the opportunity to, to share that. But, you know, when you share that with your children or with your circle of friends, those you're connected with, it's not a grand and glorious thing. It's a small thing that impacts the world in big ways. And that's, that's where I think this message t- took me today. There are things that shine light in the darkest corners of our culture, small things. But let's be faithful in these small things, and then we'll get to see God do his work of big things, changing the world. If you want to experience big things in your life from God, they only come as you walk faithful in the small things. Stay current. On confessing your sins and forsaking them. Don't let them pile up. Be faithful in those small things. If you want a big thing in your life called mercy, confess and forsake those things that are distracting and entangling you into the sinful things that hold you down. How about making 2019 and I'm not, a, I'm not a yearly resolution guy. I just saw an article actually last night. They said the typical January 1st New Year's resolution is broken by January 12th. I was surprised it made it that long. <laughs> like, wow, <laughs> 12 days. <laughs> I'm sort of more like a daily resolution guy. Lord, I, 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 I blew it. Would you please forgive me, you know? What happens when you make, from, in my mind, what happens if I make a yearly resolution, I break it, I'm done for the year. You know, I, I can't go back there. It didn't, didn't work out. But it's not that way with God. You know, you have a certain struggle. You confess it, repent it, forsake of it, get free of it, and you find yourself back in it again. Confess it, repent, and forsake it again. Don't let Satan say you're stuck there now. Get free of it because that's what the blood of Jesus does for us. It gives us an ability to walk in freedom and not continue in that sin. <laughs> My hope for all of us is that we see God flood Hope Church with mercy this year, that we walk in confession, repentance, and get to see his mercy leading us into life, into spreading his gospel to those who need it. You know, in Travis's opening comments, and and this shouldn't surprise me, but it happens all the time, where his songs or his words are like, he's stealing my message. (laughs) Did you see my message, Travis? <laughs> you know, he mentioned the need to see God help us in even the small things. Uh, and that's what we're going to close with a song here. And I'm just going to ask you, let it, let it be your prayer. Lord, help me to be faithful to, to see you fulfill my small dreams. Yeah, we may have some big dreams, and those are good and needed. But if you've got a small dream that you're hoping to have a, a, a victory in a sm- might be a small area in your life, it's not small and insignificant to God. It's a big thing for you. It's a big thing for God. This, would, this, is, this song is about God's faithfulness to you in the small things and his ability to empower you in the small things, to walk in faithfulness in those small things and see him turn your world upside down, really to see your world turned right side up again. So we're just going to listen to the song, and then I may close in prayer after that. It's a mama singing songs about the Lord It's a daddy spending family time The world says he cannot afford These simple moments change the world It's a pastor at a tiny little church Forty years of loving on the broken and the hurt simple moments 
Father, thank you so much for your kindness to us. Thank you that that we do not have to cover our sin. Our son's been co- our sin's been covered already by the blood of the Lamb. Lord, help us to walk in confession, forsake our sins, repent of them, and see your mercy flood in and give us what we need: power for living, uh, grace for the struggles, comfort for the tribulations. Everything we need, Lord, help. We need help. Bless you and thank you. Let us be a people who can say, God is able to help. God has helped me. Lord, we just do pray as a church here, Lord, just let us be used by you, even in our homes, especially in our homes, with those we live with, and and in this church, with those we rub elbows with. And yes, of course, in the world, with those who need light in their darkness. Help us to be faithful, Lord, and encourage us to be filled with your spirit and to be filled with your word and to be faithful to share that with others even and especially in the small things amen hey feel free to go back to those conversations that we interrupted earlier